Thank you for joining us at First Assembly of God Church in Clear Lake, California. Please welcome our pastor, Steve Schneider. Last week, we talked about Cain was not Abel. This week, we're going to talk about Babel versus Bible. Changing the language. You might say God's language versus mankind's language. Truth, all dealing with truth versus lies. We know certain great events happened in the Bible. One of the greatest events that happened that most people recognize, at least know the story of, is Noah's Ark. It took him 100 years to build this 550-foot ship, um, three decks on it, and... Uh, all the animals that were saved. And some people say, well, how could he go and gather all the animals? Well, he didn't have to. God sent the animals in. Just like by instinct, certain birds will fly a 1,000 miles to migrate or certain whales will migrate a 1,000 miles. God put that into them and he put, chose which animals he wants. And I'm sure of the larger animals, he probably had little, still infant or baby animals go in, if you're wondering like about elephants and all of that. God knows what he's doing. But that was a cleansing of the earth because if you read in Genesis chapter 6, you read about the sons of God, which were angelic beings, had relations with women, and they produced a race of giants that... Um, uh, it's throughout, you, you read it, what's happened, and, and we have archaeology that will show you that, but they don't want to show you that because it doesn't fit the narrative of evolution. Come on. Come on. But it's there. Uh, we have them in, in, um, in our country, uh, not eight, nine, ten-foot skeletons. So anyway, all of that got destroyed, and what remained was Noah. His bloodline wasn't tainted with that. Now, when you think ahead, God knew he was going to come and inhabit a body, and that body could not be tainted by that demonic thing. So he had to keep the bloodline pure. That's why we have all the genealogies and all of that. And so that wasn't in the eight humans there, but what was still in the eight humans was the fallen nature that came, that we inherited, it's in our DNA, that was the fallen nature. And that's why when Jesus was born, Mary conceived by the Holy Spirit, not Adam, and he did not have a body from the fall. So anyway, the great event of the flood came, and then after that, the next great event was the Tower of Babel. And in that particular situation, there are, again, demonic things that are entering in to mankind and people getting a spirit of pride on them, not really wanting to do what God had called them to do, and they were absolutely united in this effort of really not following God. Now, what happens if you ever see like a whole mob of angry people? Well, you can have one or two but as they get together, it, it, it ferments, and, and it gets greater and greater and greater, and the, and the unity of falling away from God, God had to separate them by changing their language, giving them a different language. He had to bring a judgment. Now, a lot of people take the word judgment as something negative. It's not. It's very good. Judgment separates good from the bad good from evil. Just like if you had to have an operation and remove something, that, a tumor or something, you had, that had to be removed, had to be taken out. There was a judgment there. Don't take out you know, a, a part that's good. Take that part out. And so God had to bring judgment to separate good from evil, and he had to give them different languages. Uh, people get so corrupted by the myth of evolution that they think, well, you know, it just had to evolve and, and all of that. Are you kidding me? You ever notice how quickly a little kid can pick up a language? 
God gave us the ability to do these things. I mean, Mozart, the great composer, was composing things at five years of age. That's just a God-given gift. Do you know what he's doing now? He's decomposing. <laughs> he's not composing anymore. Anyway, <laughs> this, that's for free. <laughs> All right, so this brings us to the time after the flood, Genesis chapter 10. We're going to look at verse 6, I mean verse 1, then skip to verse 6, verses 8 through 10. Now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, and that's the guy we're going to focus on, Japheth, and the sons, sons were born to them after the flood. Then verse 6 says, the sons of Ham were Cush, and we're going to be talking about that guy, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Then in verse 8 is when we see, Cush begat Nimrod. 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 You act like you're surprised by that. So Nimrod was the great-grandson of Noah. Okay? And he began to be a mighty one on the earth. So it's under this guy. Corruption, again, is entering into mankind. He was like a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like a slogan, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Well, some people pronounce it Babel, but it's not Babylonia. It's Babylonia. Um, they can babble with Babel all they want. But it's just a fable if they babble with Babel. Babel, Eric, Akkad. I'm getting a little crazy here. It's my second sermon. Okay. Still crazy after all these years? Um, uh, okay. Calm down, Pastor Z. <laughs> a mind is a terrible thing to waste. In the land of Shinar. Okay, so we're looking at Ham, who was the son of Noah, then Cush, and then Babel. Okay, that takes us to the Tower of Babel, Genesis chapter 11, starting with verse 1. Babel. 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 <laughs> it, it'll... Uh, I'll babble in, in the Babel all I want. <laughs> now, the whole earth had one language and one speech. Well, why is that? Because they all came from Noah. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. So they're out in this open place here. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and baked them thoroughly, and they had bricks for stone, and they had asphalt for murder, mortar. Now, where do you get asphalt from? The tar pits. And, uh, of course, they're still rich in oil and all of that. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city. No mention of God. And a tower whose top is in the heavens. So reaching up into the sky, and it's kind of like a thing of building a, you know, the high places where people used to go on altar, God's, uh, and have their altars and sacrifice to demons. It's kind of like, okay, we're going to build this thing up, but it was, it, there's a very demonic thing about this. Not just building a big building is bad, but when you're building it to exalt yourself, and in that pride, along comes the devil who wants to magnify that pride so you turn away from God and don't listen to him. So whose top is in the heavens, it says, let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth, lest we do what God's told Noah is to multiply and fill the earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begun to do. This is what, now look what they're doing. Now nothing that they propose to do will be beheld from them. There's something about the 
unity of evil. It's a lot easier to unify around evil than to unify around good. I've talked before about the gravity of sin. And you can use the gravity, comes from the word grave. But really when we talk about how grave it is, how bad it is, the, the power of gravity pulling things down to earth, pulling you down. Sin will pull you down. God wants to lift you up to him. And so nothing that they propose to do and this evil thing will, will be withheld from them. They're in unity. And if you notice, in the political realm, how unified one side is that's for abortion, uh, really bent on tearing up our Constitution and throw it away, and the other side can't even elect a speaker. It's very difficult for good people to come together because we're always being attacked and we're always, being, we're always accusing one to another. When Jesus was accused of casting out demons by Beelzebub, he said the kingdom of darkness is not disunified or they wouldn't stand. They're unified. And it's a lot easier to get behind, you know, some bunch of people get angry. That's a lot easier to fall into that than to go and be a blessing to everybody and everything. So I'm just saying that this unity was solid, and it was not good. God saw that it was not good, and sometimes he'll take us out of things to keep us from destroying ourselves. He has to do it. Sometimes think, well, the devil's that, doing this. God say, no, I'm the one's doing it, because if you keep going this direction, you're going to fall off the cliff. So, verse 7, come, let us, interesting language here, Referring to God as God spoke. Well, who was he speaking to? The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Okay, so let us go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Now, the word in Hebrew for confuse means to overflow. And in other words, to mix, mix up, to confound. It's not to lie is to overflow. So God changed their language. He did not do what the devil does. The devil changes language in order to lie. God just gave them different dialects so they couldn't be as united in the evil that they were headed to do. Verse 8, so the Lord scattered them abroad, from there, over the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. They, they couldn't communicate now to get to do this one thing. And we're going to see throughout the Bible that the, the, the city of Babylon is absolutely anti-God. And it's a place of, of, that's going to be con considerable judgment from God. But this is where it all began. Therefore, its name is Babel meaning confusion. That's what the word means, like you babble on, you babble on, you babble on, babble on. I'll never forget, in ninth grade, I was in this high school, and this, this poor kid, he had trouble with stuttering. And we were studying the history of Babylon. And he called him on, and he says, ba 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 babylon The guy never lived it down. I felt sorry for him. He was just babbling. Because, therefore, the name is called Babel because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. So we see a difference between the devil lies. He actually changes the language. He changes the meaning of words. Like instead of abortion, it's freedom of choice. He calls good evil. He calls evil, well, that's good. Always changes the language. Not a different dialect, but changes the meaning of words. 
Without God's word, good is often confused with evil. The devil will take our language and distort the meanings in order to deceive people with lies that he wants them to do. He perverts the truth about God, about his creation, and he's always lying. He's such a liar that he's lied to himself. The devil actually believes he's going to triumph over God. Even though it's written in the word what's going to happen to him, he's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. When Jesus comes back, he's going to, put shut, he's going to be shut up for 1,000 years, then placed in this place where they'll never get out, the devil and all that are following him. But he doesn't believe that. There are people today that just don't believe it. Well, if I just choose not to believe it, it's not true. Because they've been taught that whatever they think in their own mind is true for them. They change the words. They change the language. They change the meanings. God's word is truth. God's word is defined as it's quick and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing asunder the soul and the spirit. The word of God cuts through the nonsense and brings out the truth. Cuts through the babble from the Bible. The pride of life was what was going on in that day. By God's own way, he absolutely had to make a difference in our lives. It's, it's an interesting thing. God gave us really freedom of choice. And there's times when he will intervene. There's times when he won't. That's why he doesn't answer every one of our prayers all the time. Because there are times when he wants to intervene, especially when it will lead people into the truth about him. But there's other times when he just doesn't answer our prayers, and he says, you just have to trust me, because I'm working all things together for good in the light of eternity. And that's the truth. That's just like more important than anything. The same God who created the heavens and the earth provided one way to him. It's his way. Through the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Made up ways are in the thousands. Just, well, I believe it's okay, true for me. Well, you know, if you're wanting to go north and you drive south, I don't care how much you believe it, you're going the wrong direction. The babble of the world cannot compare with the Bible's word of truth. And we have to ask ourselves today, what am I embracing most of the time? The babble of this world or the Bible, God's truth? 1 Corinthians 1, chapter 1, verse 21 says in New Living Translation, Since God, in his wisdom, saw to it that the world would never know him, through human wisdom. He has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. And he's using kind of tongue-in-cheek the word foolish that people call foolish. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven, and it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. Remember the Greek, where they were known for their mighty philosophers. And Socrates says this, and we have all these different Greek philosophers, and, and they're only gaining wisdom from what they can see and what they can sense. They're not getting wisdom from God. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. See, it's the Word of God that gives us faith. It's the Word of God that contains the language of truth. The words of the devil contain lies. Jesus said he was a liar from the beginning, 
There is no truth in him. He cannot tell you a truth. He can quote a true statement, but then put a lie to it to misapply it. He quoted the scripture to Jesus, but put the wrong meaning to it to get Jesus to fall into temptation. God sent us the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. Verse 24, but to those who are called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ, the power of God, the power to get you into the truth, the power to set you free from mental torment. Who the Son of God sets free is free indeed. And I'm telling you, there's no one slicker than the devil at lying. A good liar is not found out until it's too late. But as long as you have the light, God's word is light. As long as you have the light of the word, you will not enter in that darkness. But you've got to make sure that your heart is pure when you're reading his word so you don't put an agenda behind his word that's yours and not his. There's a lot of that going on. We've got to be careful about that. The biggest problem right now with a lot of churches, and I'm talking about evangelical churches who believe God's word, believe Jesus is the Son of God, believe in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, believe that you can only be saved by Jesus. These people, there's many of them who have confused the first coming with Jesus with the second coming of Jesus. Jesus was asked, why have you come? To take away the sin of the world. Not to establish a physical kingdom now. If you go down that route, you're going to be disappointed. Now, where did he say the kingdom was? Within you. Well, who's in you? The Holy Spirit. But he says, I will give you power to, over serpents and scorpions, and I will give you the power to heal and all of these things. But that doesn't mean that every time guaranteed he's going to do everything that you say. Because his kingdom is now. It's got to be. Oh, I guess I just didn't have enough faith. Okay, get this scenario. God is up there big frown on his face. He's looking at you. You're praying. Hmm. If they had that much more faith, I'd give it to them. But I'm not. Are you kidding me? How about his will being done? How about he gives you the faith when, he, when you need it? God says, go talk to that person I need you to tell him something. I don't know what I'm going to say, but God told you. All of a sudden, and now God's speaking through you. He came to take away the sin of the world, and a lot of the churches won't even talk about sin. Then you don't need a Savior. You don't need Jesus. Everything's the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Jesus said, he will only speak the words I've spoken. And then you got churches that don't believe in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> what a mess. Just read the Bible, take it in context, get rid of the babble, and get into the Bible. All right. I'll be okay later on. I even forgot where I am. Okay, I'm having a fit up here. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and Christ is the wisdom of God. This foolish, tongue-in-cheek, plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest human strength. I'll just use that as an example. It says God's plan is foolish, so I don't have to follow it. I am just believe in his word. Stupid. That's just Stupid. Oh, God's weak. I, I hope the devil doesn't win. Are you kidding me? It's no, when, no one, when it's tongue-in-cheek, no one is the truth. That's what the Holy Spirit will show you. Just read it in context. God is always working now. Right now, he wants you with him. Right now, he wants your entire life. Right now, he wants to give you the power to overcome any sin that's trying to separate you from him. 
That's why he came. And he's looking for those that he can show himself strong through. Could he show himself strong through Adam and Eve after they just sinned? What were they doing? Hiding. It's human nature. You, you, you do, you're naughty, and you do something you know you shouldn't do, and you want to hide from God. Well, I'm probably not, not, I probably don't have any anointing now. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. When you got saved, he knew you were going to do that stupid thing, and he still loves you. But live with him now, not just for the future, but now. Today is the day of salvation, of being saved from our sins. Matthew 16, 26, Jesus puts it this way. So what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What, is it, what good does it do if you get all the stuff? Look at all the movie stars. Look at all the rock and roll players that end up overdosing on drugs. They had all the money. They had the mansions. They had the Lamborghinis. They had everything you would think they want. All the groupies, if you want that. They have everything, and they end up overdosing. Why? Because only God can fill that empty spot inside of us. Lose your soul. Babylon has re represented false religions ever since the Tower of Babel. It's the sin of turning away from God and exchanging it for the demonic, self-originated beliefs and religions. All false religions were invented by either a man or inspired by demonic things that want to take you away from God. God had told Noah to replenish the earth, all the earth, and his descendants were to follow God's will, not stay in one place, not make a name just for themselves. It's a fact of that throughout history, the people of Babylon have always rebelled and gone their own way. In addition to that, God even used Babylon as a place of judgment to send his own people, some of the Jews from Judah, Jews from Judah, who disobeyed him, and they had to give, get a wake-up call. Second Chronicles 9.1 so all Israel was recorded by genealogies. And indeed, they were inscribed in the book of the kings of Israel. But Judah was carried away captive to Babylon because of their unfaithfulness. In this day, there's a spirit of Babylon that we don't want to be taken captive by. We have the power of Almighty God living in us. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in this world. That doesn't mean everything is perfect and you can pray away every problem. Otherwise, the disciples would not have been martyred for their lives. You tell me they didn't have enough faith? Sometimes there's a special blessing for those who give their life for Christ. And we don't know what's ahead of us, but some of us might have to face that. The way everything's going right now. Babylon is going strong right now, spiritually. The spirit of Babylon is bringing confusion into people's lives today. People are so confused, they don't even know who they are. And in the last days, we read it in the book of Revelation, just around the corner. Here we go again, more about Babylon. Revelation chapter 17. Then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, that's John the Revelator speaking, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Great harlot, false religions. Sits on, what's water represent? Many waters represents people. Many people. And whom, with, with whom, verse 2, the the kings of the earth committed fornication. What is that talking about? God referred to it all throughout the Old Testament. When they went and served other gods, they were in they were, it was fornication or adultery, or they were being the harlot. One God, one mate, 
We're joined with him. We're the bride of Christ. And these people, even those who are said they were joined to Christ and are going to these things, committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk, intoxicated with the wine of her fornication, joined with demonic things. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. That's her organized religion, and that includes humanism. Humanism is a religion. Atheism is a religion, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, speaking of nations. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Two important words, purple always represented God, right? Well, it represents really here the dominion of these false religions over the nations. And the scarlet blood represents the persecution of Israel. Look what's happening right now. Who ever thought it would turn to this? And adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, standing for the richness of these religions. You look at some of these, look at the money that some of these people from the oil and all that, and all the sex trafficking and all the stuff going on. It's going on all around the world. Having her in her hand a golden cup full of abominations. That, that gold, people are drawn to that gold. It's the allurement of these evil religions and blasphemies against God and the filthiness of her fornication. Now here, now here it comes to light. What is causing this? And on her forehead was written a name, Mystery Babylon, the Great. The word mystery speaks of spiritual, not physical. Spiritual, demonic intoxication where people are not in their right mind and cannot reason with the word of God. The mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. They're not of Christ, they're of the Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist is working all around the world. And you can tell all the way back in the Old Testament, the hatred for the Jews, because God gave the Jews his word. And from the Jews came the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And God says, and you read in the book of Romans, God's going to deal with them. And they're very hard-headed people, many of them. And it's going to take going through that tribulation thing for them to recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord. Then every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. What's it all about? What's, what's the problem? Sin. Who's our answer for sin? Jesus, giving your life to him, he pays the price for all your sins, no matter what you've done. Forgiven, totally. God is bigger than any of our sins. But then he gives us an ability to where I'm not the way I used to be. We're still, we still have the fall in this body. We still can get tempted or hang, but it's nowhere near like it was. And every day is a new day that we get to dedicate ourselves to the Lord. That's why it's so good. You wake up in the day, just dedicate it to the Lord, spend some time with him, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The kingdom of God is what he is doing in the earth right now. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, will be fulfilled when Jesus comes back to earth. But in the meantime, we can ask for God to touch the hearts of people, just like he touched us. We can ask God to bring healing, because 
He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healing healer. By his stripes we're healed. We still, we walk in love. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things, but it doesn't stop there. Love endures all things. So while you're enduring, still trust in God. Still stay with him, no matter what's going on. Nothing in this world is more important than your relationship with Jesus Christ. Verse 7, in the measure she, that she glorified herself, in the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen. I am no widow and will not see tomorrow. She sees herself as the great queen instead of what she really is, the harlot. It's talking about not just one person, but it's talking about the spirit behind that and the people following that spirit. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. Jesus said, pray that you'll be counted worthy to escape the things that are coming on the earth, the judgment of the earth. I do not believe that God's going to come down and persecute his bride. Some people believe post, you know, rapture and all that. It just doesn't fit the whole pattern of God. As in the days of Noah, God took Noah above the tribulation. As in the days of, who else? Lot. Lot. They came out, and then the judgment came. In closing, I want you to look at this scripture. Bible versus Babel. 1 Timothy 6, verses 20 through 21. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. This is speaking to believers who have the word and the truth in them. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By, for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. And then he says an important little four-letter sentence. Great grace be with you. Grace is an empowerment to overcome evil, to overcome temptation. It's God's mercy working in you. It's also defined as loving kindness. We're saved by grace, and then we live by grace. Is an a beautiful thing, a study I did years ago about the difference between the grace of God and the anointing of God. And basically, the grace of God is to be able to have and walk in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, all of those. The anointing is for the gifts of the Spirit. Being able to to have the gift of prophecy, the, the gift of speaking with tongues and interpretation. That's the anointing. We need both. They're both God's idea, so they're probably a good idea. And Jesus, Jesus absolutely, when he, when he coached Paul, which he did for I don't know how long, but Paul got all this revelation. He says, do not forbid the speaking in tongues. Well, you got to black that out of some churches you go to. Because you speak in tongues, they'll throw you out. It's not for today. Well, if you take that thing, well, I guess Jesus is not for today. But Hebrews, what, was it 13.8? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, last scripture. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 13 and 14. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. We think with comparisons. When you look at all the Babel stuff going in, you're going to hear God's truth. You're going to be comparing it to the Babel and get off. When you compare the word with the word, that's when you'll think clearly. God, in his infinite intelligence, of putting 37.2 trillion, 
trillion cells in your body all working together without you even knowing it certainly makes the way for you to understand him and to walk and to rightly divide the word of truth so you need not be ashamed. God is at work revealing himself. He's always revealing himself. But we got to know the day and the time that we live and know that really right now he's pleading, saying the harvest is white and the workers are few. Get out and share the word and get people into, the, into God's kingdom where sin doesn't reign anymore, but the grace of God reigns. Verse 14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. He's got too much babble in here to, to really get the Bible. Be careful how much babble that you enter into throughout the day. Spend some time in God's Word and let God's Word speak to you. I like just turn it on, let it, you know, Bible Gateway or, uh, you know, the, the Gideons have a good Bible app. And you can put it on, it'll, it'll be there in front of you and it'll read it to you. Uh, there's different ways. You know, some people have more problems reading than others, but you can sit there and listen to it. When I was first started ministry, I had the entire Bible on cassette tape. And I had one of those little Ford Courier trucks, you know, I put one of these stereos in it, the cassette tape. Everywhere I went, I started with Genesis. I'm listening to the whole thing. Over where I was driving. And, and before I got in ministry, I was with the drummer who helped me get saved. We would travel to Canada. We'd travel everywhere, driving there. All we would listen to is expository teaching on the Word of God. And then we talk about it. And when he's talking about it, it just sharpens, iron sharpens iron. And, and, and uh, he ended up being a Calvary Chapel pastor for 30-some years. And uh, he was a great drummer, and he could, sing, he could sing up falsetto with the Bee Gees. I mean, he, he could get up that high, and he always heard good harmonies, could always sing harmonies, and he had a real great sense of humor and everything. And, and uh, it was, you know, God put me in that band just so I would get saved. So I would, I would come back to the Lord. <clears throat> I want to ask you just to bow your head. If you're here today and your life is not right with Christ, you know, you can hear it. God, the Holy Spirit, gives us that wonderful conviction to help us get pointed in the right direction. And maybe you've never asked Jesus from a sincere heart to be your Lord. In other words, be the one you submit to, as well as your Savior. Or maybe you have in the past, but you haven't really been living it out. Well, the first thing you do is say, I'm sorry, God. That's repentance. And say, I'm sorry, Lord. I, I don't want to do that thing that you know is taking me away from you. And Jesus will tell you, I defeated that on the cross. Walk in my power, and you'll be amazed how you will be victorious. You just have to embrace it. So if you're here today and you would like to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, just raise your hand. We want to pray for you. And give you that opportunity. See that hand there? Thank you. Somebody else? I see that hand over there. Somebody else? I see that hand there. Somebody else? Maybe you've done it before, but you hadn't done it is, uh, you know, we say it hadn't, hadn't stuck yet. Well, it means that you're really not there, and you really need to get there. Anybody else? Raise your hand. Okay, you can put your hands down. I'm going to ask everybody, if you would, just to stand with me. And um, <clears throat> the ones who raise your hands, I just really want to encourage you to get prayer. We're going to have our prayer people come up. Let, come on up, you guys. You guys are going to be praying for people. Our musicians, come on up. And... Um, while they're getting ready, I want to just have everybody repeat this after me. We're going to talk to Father God. Is that okay to talk to Father God? Yes. Okay. Say, Father God, thank you for never giving, never giving up on me. Thank you for sending your son to take my place for my sins. I believe you sent him for me. 
Because you want me close to you. Therefore, I give my life to you. What I have left, I give it to you, Lord. Restore me. Fill me. Help me to follow you by the power of Almighty God and the Holy Spirit. I declare Jesus is Lord and Savior. I believe you died for all my sins. And you rose again from the dead. Therefore, according to your word, I am saved. And I am a child of God. I've been grafted in. I've been adopted. And who the Son of God sets free is free indeed. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give him praise. Amen.